Welcome back to the third talk, which is uh, why climate change is so special as a threat, because it's long-term, intergenerational, involving our kids and grandchildren, and it's irreversible. Once we have put in the CO2, it remains uh, in the atmosphere. For all practical purposes, there's no clearance. Very little, uh, hundreds of years it takes until it's, uh, it is cleared. So for policy reasons, we have to think about this is once the genie is out of the bottle, it's in the atmosphere and we can't get it back. So what does that mean for health? And we have to step back a little bit. And before I go further, I have to explain to you why everybody talks about a two degree level. Why is it that scientists and, and politicians for once agree that we should not go beyond? And you see here a graph from the IPCC. On the left, you see the temperature from zero to five degrees. And the five columns denote now very broad systems on which climate change impacts. And health is folded in the fourth column. So let's go through the columns from left to right. Unique and threatened system means uh, loss of species. You know that biodiversity loss is one effect of climate change. The next one is extreme weather events. We had this already in the previous lecture that as temperature increases, as there's more energy in the atmosphere, there will also be more extreme events. The third is the distribution of impacts. We already talked about distribution, that meaning that there is more um, heat to be expected in the North Pole, in the South Pole, and then there is a very ill distribution of rainfall and so forth. So this will be um, aggravated, the distribution of impacts. And the fourth column is now where health is folded. Um, and this is global aggregate impacts. That's impacts on agriculture, on forests, and you name it. So health is just one impact of many, many others. For you and certainly for me, it's a special impact because it's about things that I care most, namely my health and particularly the health of my children. And the one to the very right, the column is large scale singular events. We talked about this as well. These are these events you don't even want to think about, like the reversal of the Gulf Stream or the stopping of the Gulf Stream and breaking off of ice shields leading to immediate increase of um, sea level. And you see the color uh, shades. There's nothing magic about the two degree line. You can't say with 2.1 degree it all of a sudden becomes dangerous and at 1.9 degree we can all be um, folding our hands and leaning back. It is just a convention like you drive through a town with 30 miles per hour. You need to have a judgment when is a line to be drawn. And as I said, two degrees sounds very uh, logical because you have uh, still a very low risk for these huge events. You are still left with not so much of the aggregate effects um, uh, increasing, um, for example, health. Uh, you still have a lot, already have a loss of uh, biodiversity and we know it, we can measure it. And you already have extreme weather events and you see it in the news. So nothing magic, it's a convention, it's an agreement that this is something we should all go for. Now, um, the, the atmosphere we talked about is like, um, if you like, like a vessel. You can put CO2 in, you can put more CO2 in, and what you get back is a warming effect. So how is now warming related to the amount of tons, the number of tons of carbon that we put up in the air? And um, don't be uh, shocked, this is now a very complicated uh, graph, but I will uh, guide you through it. These two degrees, as the right part of the graph so, uh, shows, are linked to a budget of 3,000 gigatons. 3,000 gigatons seems to be a lot, but the bad news is we have spent or already almost two-thirds of it. Now, I want to exemplify something on the, with this graph that I've time and again stressed, that we talk about probabilities, that there are always uncertainties in everything that any climate scientist, in fact, any scientist says, there is a certain degree of uncertainty. Truth is not something that scientists can um, declare. 
So uh, if you see that green line, you could also say for the same uh, degree of warming, meaning two degrees, you could also have this at 4,700 4, gigatons pumped into the air. Or if you go to the left, you could have this at 2,300 2, gigatons. So it's quite a bandwidth, but still the most likely amount is the 3,000 gigatons. On the other hand, if you go up and down the graph, you could end up, by keeping 3,000 gigatons, you could end up with 2.6 degrees or with 1.1 degree. So there are these margins, but they should not confuse you. We uh, keep with our central tendency, and that is 2 degrees, 3,000 uh, gigatons, and that's what everybody works with. So that's our budget, and uh, we better not overspend it, lest we go beyond the 2 degree level. This is a graph that you have seen already in special incarnations. It shows on the uh, x-axis horizontally the years, and it goes until 2300. And the colored curves are various climate scenarios. And I owe you also now, since you're already uh, climate experts, what RCP means to explain what RCP means. RCP means representative concentration pathways. This is the uh, watts per square meter, the energy that a certain climate model has uh, as an assumption put in the atmosphere. Don't worry, for all practical purposes, you can see RCP 8.5 is the, the most um, pronounced climate scenario, and the others are, are a, a little bit less uh, pronounced. And we must make sure that we are following the path of the green and the violet one. They are all based on assumptions, among others, how mankind behaves, how the economy grows, how population increases, and many other things. Now here you see in this little box I put myself. This is my lifespan. I was born in 1952, and God knows how long I will live. I put a normal lifespan here. And so I will see not so much of this uh, warming and also the health impacts. But I will and do put CO2 in the air, which will stay there uh, from today until 2300. So what I do today will have an impact on future generations. And that is something that mankind has never faced. And in health, we know a lot of risk factors, but we don't know of a risk factor that uh, once uh, is sort of uh, you're exposed, persists across generations. Now here's my daughter, is the first generation. She will suffer much more. She will experience a larger warming, and God forbid that we reach, uh, following the blue line, already four degrees. Next generation, uh, her children, will be even more exposed, and so forth. You see, we have now something that goes beyond us. Being selfish may be okay in some instances, but certainly not in climate change. What we do now is for our kids and our grandchildren. I don't want to be the generation that has messed up the climate and that future generation will curse because of this. That's the last slide, and it's also a little bit complicated. I want to show you how climate, health, and policy is linked. Because you may be nervous of always hearing about policy, policy, and you may only be interested in health. Why should you be interested in climate policy? And here is hopefully the answer. And you see, this is also the concept graph of our course, which has been used in the teaser. So that uh, link here between greenhouse gas emissions and land use should be obvious to you now. It leads to climate change if we allow it to uh, proceed. And climate change, in the, if we don't do anything, and if climate change gets out of control, will lead to disease, which is the green part of this box, and very serious disease, the red part, and then hopefully not, but possible death. So that's the scenario where nothing is done in terms of adaptation, in terms of doing something about it. And we don't want this to happen. So the first thing we'll do is what we call in climate jargon, adaptation. That means what can the health system do to protect 
health from deteriorating, in the absence of anything preventing climate change to happening. So we are a little bit um, working on the end of the causal chain rather than going upstream and doing something about stopping uh, the increase of uh, warming and of climate change. But we have to do it because it's already committed. Part of this climate change is already there and we need to manage it. So we need to figure out what can we do, what are the climate sensitive diseases and what can we do, where will they be most uh, likely, which age groups, which gender will be mostly affected, where, what can we do to prepare for the impact. But you will easily see that this is a little bit um, short-sighted. We need to go upstream and this is now, we need to have a, a link to our policymakers who are not so interested in health. And we need to tell them, look, if you don't stop this, and here's the, the brown arrow, which stops the increase in greenhouse gas emissions through climate policy and stops the deforestation of, of uh, tropical forests by policy in Paris, for example, this year in December, we will not solve the health problem because we cannot uh, deal with increasing numbers of sick people, some dying, without stopping this uh, in the, at the causal, at the root cause. So this is why I had this mitigation, which is the jargon for climate policy box, in green and in brown. Brown is the color for policy in my graph. And the beautiful thing is, and the very positive thing among a lot of very negative messages is that by doing climate policy, which may be expensive, but by doing it, we will also reap huge health benefits, which means if we, for example, uh, reduce uh, transport by car, we will be healthier, fitter. If we reduce cooking by biomass, fewer women will die of um, respiratory diseases and so forth. So that is the very positive note. And you see health now immediately below climate change. So there is no contradiction between a healthy population and a climate healthy planet. They go hand in hand. Only if we allow this to go from left upper to right lower part, that is what we need all to avoid. Thank you very much.